Hi, I'm Jeremy Robinson and this is the 19th hole. I'm Jeremy Robinson and welcome to the second edition of the Black Star podcast, The 19th Hole, presented by Glal.uk. As I mentioned previously, through my years of being involved in golf, both competing with Black Star, I've met some great people, not only from the playing and the coaching side of the game, but also from the business side. During these podcasts, I know that with the guests we have on, we'll have a lot of fun discussing the ups and downs of golf. Today, I'm delighted to welcome another great friend of mine from years gone by, Paul Way. Paul's a two-time Ryder Cup player and a three-time winner on the DP World Tour, which included beating beating Sandy Lyle in the playoff to win the 1985 PGA Championship. Paul, how is it? And uh, many thanks for joining us. All good, Jerry. Uh, Not playing much golf, but all good. Good. Well, not good that you're not playing much, but good that you're good. Anyway, so as we... uh, Say again, sorry. sorry. It's good for me that I'm not playing too much. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't believe that. But anyway, the last guy we had on was another friend of we all know, was uh, David Lynn. So what we're doing yeah. during the podcast, we're asking uh, the guest to ask a question to the, uh, to the next guest. So at the end of our chat, you'll be asking a question to uh, Steve Richardson. But in the meantime, I've got a little recording here of what Lynn wanted to ask you. So I'll let him... Uh, ask the question. So here you go, Wei Wei. I'd probably lighten the mood and I'd go straight for the uh, why you called Wei Wei. Yeah. I've heard a couple of reasons as to why he's called Wei Wei. Now keep this clean. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, the female version of why he's called Wei Wei is when he, uh, a new girlfriend of his years and years ago, when he first got naked with her, she went, wow, that's way, way smaller than what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> uh, and the other one is obviously on the golf course when he used to hit his driver and I think uh, the marshals used to go and point and go, that's way, way over there. So is that the, is that the reason he got his nickname? It's another question, really, because... Um, Are you sure on that? Yeah, I'm definitely sure. I've, I've got three sisters. As you might know two of them that were in the golf. And Nikki was a pro and Jackie played well. Yeah. But, you know, when you're at school in the 70s, um, there, there was a, a, a lady on, on TV. She was called Wei Wei Wong. So <laughs> all my sisters were sort of called Wei Wei Wong because she, da- she was a dancer. She was on the golden shot with Bob Monkhouse and she was actually in the in Man with the Golden Gun, James Bond film. So she was quite a sort of famous Chinese actress and she was called Wei Wei Wong. So of course, you know, in the school of the 70s, the kids called us all Wei Wei Wong. And I guess the Wong got dropped off and we were just left with Wei Wei. So yeah, all my sisters were called it and then I was called it. But, you know, I, I take it really, because I could have been called Milky, I could have been called Ivor. So, you know, it could have I could have had some terrible nicknames. Um and then and then going back to my initials, P G W. Um oh, yeah. my, well my, my mum said sort of when I was a bit older, she said, Oh, your your great um your real granddad, my dad, he died, you know, with T B when I was only about five in, in the war. In about 1939, I think it was start of the war, and uh, he said um, he he was called Albert, and, and your your third name's um, Albert, and I said, oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was always Paul Graham. I said, hang on a minute. So my my name's Paul Graham Albert. I said, well, I'll take that. That's PGA. <laughs> so I, I couldn't believe it when she told me. So. You know, my three initials, or my four initials, really, are PGAW. So it could, it, it, you know, PGA was sort of on the cards for me to win, I suppose. PGAW winning at Wentworth, you know, incredible, really. 
So basically, Linny was far, far away from being correct. He was miles away, yeah. And if you if you look on the internet, Wei Wei Wong, she was a famous dancer and actress <laughs> on the Golden Shot with Bunk, Bob Monkhouse. And when we were all called that through the seventies on school at school, <laughs> and then that, that's what I landed with. But like I say, I could have been called Milky. I could have been called Ivor. I could have been called anything. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, all right. Well, that's got that um, sorted out. So let's get back onto a bit more serious stuff to start with. Anyway. So yeah. going back to rolling the years back again to the Bob Monkhouse era, how did you kind of get into golf then? Uh, Dad was a good footballer and he'd stopped playing football in his sort of mid-30s and um, started to play golf a bit more. Um, you know, I just caddied for him at hole tight. It was a little nine-hole Heathland course. Um, used to hit a few balls going around when I was eight, nine, you know, ten-ish. And then... Tunbridge, where we lived, there was a, a new um, <clears throat> municipal public course opened up called Poltwood. Um, so when I was about 10, 11, that opened up. And of course, it was ideal. Got a half set of junior blue flash and off, you know, dropped off in the summer holidays and up there playing three, four rounds a day. Um, and that, that led into... The pro shop was in the in the greenkeeper's sheds at the time because the, the clubhouse was still being built. And uh, there was a sign on the counter and it said assistant pro looking for, you know, digs for a for a month or whatever. Um, so my dad, being my dad, he went in and he, he said, oh, you know, you can come, young lad, he was only 16, you can come back and stay with us. And that that was that was Paul Foston. So he ended up staying with us for seven years. We couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> and um, so he was sort of my first coach, really. Um, the dad was thinking ahead, you know, it'd be nice to have a, a sort of semi-pro assistant living with us and it will help Paul. So, yeah. So from, from that point then, when you're kind of 10, 11, 12, whatever, that, that's when you really started playing a lot of golf and kind of fell in love with the game, was it? Yeah, dad, dad was a pretty good organiser and he, during the summers, you know, organised as we all did, played in loads of junior tournaments um, all around the Kent and Sussex area. Um, he sort of intertwined it with his work. So he, well, they'd all take turns of dropping us off at all these courses, you know, Copthorne and Crowborough and Royal Ashdown, all these places. And we were there, you know, we loved the junior open days, daily, daily telegraph days. Um, so that's, you know, that's when I started playing in a lot of them when I was 11, 12, 13, 14. Um, and then, you know, when I was 15, 16, it got us into the English um, junior sides. Uh, a lot of school stuff. Um, I played uh, at Al Woodley for the you know, England versus Scotland schools. And I was captain for England there. So, you know, I'd, I didn't get... A, many good grades at, at school so my grades were our captain in England for, yeah. for the school boards yeah um, I was going to ask you that about how did school go at the time yeah I was more interested in golf <laughs> so, so and then my yeah. my, my uh, headmaster was great Roy Howard he was a sort of sporty headmaster um, and he'd let me practice on the rugby pitches and hockey pitches and stuff so that was all great yeah he was good and uh, at the time then, so 15, 16, obviously, you know, I remember actually playing in those Aer Lingus things. That's a long time ago, isn't it? But I, I, yeah, do, we, I do remember well, we, playing we, in those. We, had, we ended up winning it, actually, in 19... Would have been 1979, I think. Right. I was probably about 16. Yeah. Uh, we did a bit of a moody one, really, because uh, my headmaster, or the, the guy running the golf school thing at Hugh Christie, um, Mike McLean, oh Mike, oh Mike, you, you know well. Yeah, yeah. He came and joined my school for a, for the sixth form. Um, of course, it, then it was me, him, and one other. Yeah. But we we only you know we hardly went to school really between us. But he ended up playing for my school, Hugh Christie. So we qualified at Fox Hills, and then we were taken over to Ireland, Port, Port Marnock, and uh, we won it over there with our with our third bloke shooting about 89 <laughs> on a really windy day. And we were trying to get him in and we, we beat Sweden by a shot. 
All right, so, you won the whole thing, the whole international we, thing. We won the whole thing, yeah. We beat Sweden. All, I think it was about seven or eight countries played in it. Right. Oh, good. So, so moving on then. So that that got you nearer to around the, the first time when you started playing it, um, full international golf and full amateur tournaments. The Brabazon Trophy in 1981, the English Stroke Play Championship. So you won that at Hillside. Was that kind of the breakthrough? I mean, had you played in it before, or? Um, yeah, I had played in it in 1980 at um, Hunstanton. Um, drove all the way up there. You know, we couldn't drive. We were only 17 at the time. Um, but that year, um, Ronan Rafferty and McAvoy, um, they tied, so they, they they both won it. I don't think... I think they tried to play a playoff hole, but it was too dark. Because as you remember, in those days, it was 36 holes. and So I think they both won it that year. And that was my first year of it. Um, and then, like you say, I was, that was my first, well, I was 18, so it was my first real big year on, on the amateur circuit, although I did a few when I was 17 and, and won a few things locally, you know, West Sussex and stuff. Yeah. But well, it turned up at Hillside in 1981. And um, I always remember playing behind Ronan Rafferty and Roger Chapman and McAvoy in, a, in the practice round. So, um, you know, you'd see him drive off as you walked up to the tee and, I remember saying to myself, I thought, well, they, they don't need it any better than I do. So, you know, because they're all big names at the time. And uh, first round, it was blowing an absolute hurricane, um, 30, 40 mile an hour winds. And I played the front nine in 31. It was five under. I hold everything. I managed to come back in level par and shot 67. And the next, be next best scoring was 72. So I had a five shot lead. It was unbelievable. Mm. Uh, our old mucker, Ricky Willison, he yeah. shot about 89. And he <laughs> got 22 shots behind after one. He said, that's impossible to get it round. He said, you must have only played 12 holes. Um, my, my dad was caddying for me. And, uh, you know, like my dad sometimes caddying, you know, we had a few rows now and again, like you do with your dad. Yeah. Telling you, telling you the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, but second round, I managed to get it round in 72. So I was still five under for two rounds. And like, like you know, we only had maybe three tournaments that were four rounds. Uh, you know, the Lytham, the Berkshire and the, and the Brabazon in those days. Um, and then I, I shot 79 the third day, which was got a blue a gal again, you know, 36 holes the last day. And then I managed to hang on, shot 74 the last day and won, I think I won by about three or four in the end. Yeah, they used to be tough, those tournaments, uh, the Brabbers and that. Third, I mean, I'm, I know we were a bit younger in those days, way, way, but 36 yeah. holes on those tough courses. Was I, I was fortunate enough to, myself, actually, to win the Brabbers and a few years yeah. after you at Ganton. And again, it, it was tough playing 36 holes because they were fantastic courses, weren't they? I mean, Hillside is, yeah. in my great opinion, course. it's a great course. Ganton, another great course. Yeah. You know, so they, they were, it was tough. It was an, a good tournament to win, wasn't it? Great tournament to win. Um... You know, a lot of so I was only 18. Yeah. Um, it, it more or less guaranteed my place in the in the Walker Cup. Yeah, well, that's that's what I was going to go on to next. That's what I was kind of asking before we started. Whether, yeah, obviously you played in the Walker Cup the same year at Cypress Point. I mean, what a, what a place to go and play. But we'll go on to that in a minute. But yeah. prior to the Brabazon, were you kind of uh, in the hunt for a Walker Cup spot, or were you was oh. that just something away miles away? Not really, but I think it always helps. You know, I played for England boys when I was 15, 16, 17. And then I played for GB and I side when I was 16, 17 boys. So that all, it's always the next step, I think. So that always helps. Yeah. Um, being schoolboys captain helps and, you know, all this sort of stuff that the RNA like and whoever picks the sides. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I finished sixth at the Berkshire in, in, in the other four round tournament. Um, and they have a thing called the Scrut and Jug. So I won that. That's a, the Berkshire and the Brabazon combined. Way, way, um, we, way, way, we have so much in common. Because I won the Brabazon the, and I won yeah. the Scrut and Jug because I won the, the Berkshire in the same year, actually. Do you know the history of the Scrut, Scrut and Jug? Not really. I just know it's the combination of the Brabazon and the Berkshire put yeah. together. Well, I got quite close to the president of Berkshire and the captains and the you know lovely guys. Yeah, and uh, it was actually a, a a really good player called Philip Scrutton. Yeah, and uh, he was a World Cup player in the in the fifties, I think it was maybe late forties, fifties, 
and he, he tragically died in a in a car accident right when he was in his late 20s or 30s you know yeah, and, yeah. Um, I, I didn't know that and no i didn't um, yeah so it was it was quite nice to know that and he won his won his thing that he'd uh yeah, you know. well, no, I well, say I, I was lucky enough to win that in 1987. I didn't know that. I always wondered who he yeah. was and why, what it was called. Because it was only a little uh, plate, but it was a nice thing to win. Yeah. So going back, to your, going back to your 1981, so winning the Brabazon really just cemented, that was done and dusted then for a Walker Cup spot, if you're on the uh, radar already. Yeah, it did. Well, and also um, England won the, um, Euro we won the European team championship that, that year oh, at right. St Andrews. Yeah, yeah. So that, I, I had a good, um, I think it was 36 holes middle and then qualifying and there's a team, you know, and the, yeah, yeah. I played with Paul Downs and McAvoy, Chapman, yeah. Pete Diebel. I think Richard Boxer was supposed to play, but he was taken, Jeff Godwin, because he ended up getting the Walker Cup, he took his place because Richard was injured. Right. But it was an amazing finish to that um, uh, when England won that uh, trophy at the European Team Championships at St Andrews. It was, we were all level. Um, and basically, Peter Diebel and Ian Hutchin were in the playoff going down the first at St Andrews. And Diebel fatted his second shot. And I'm um, sorry, uh, Ian Hutchins, Scottish player, he went into the burn, you know, he just got it a bit fat and went into the burn. Yeah. Peter Diebel hit it, sort of, you know, got it over, it was downwind, got it over and he was 20 yards from the pin, but putting. And then there was 5,000 Scots people watching this, you know, it was a, it was a yeah. big thing at the time. Yeah. Not many English there. And I, I remember Ian Hutchin dropping the ball, you know, over the shoulder in those yeah. days. Yeah. And it landed in a divot. It was in a hole in a sandy divot, and the pin, I'm not exaggerating, was no more than eight, eight, foot, eight foot over the berm. Yeah. So he's, he's got no shot. He's absolutely got no shot. But it was actually Peter Diebel to putt first, and Peter Diebel knocked it up stiff, so he's made four. And Ian Hutchins now got a hole this shot, because we think we've won it. It was an impossible shot. He hold it. He hold it for a four. <laughs> Uh, it was one of the best shots I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Um, and then second hole, Diebel made par and, and Hutchin bogey. So, yeah. Um, of course, you made 5,000 Scots went absolutely mad when he chipped it in. <laughs> okay. It was an incredible shot. Yeah. And then he three putted the next and England won it. So that did cement, you know, my place in it as well, I think, you know. Yeah. So just moving on to say that, that Walker Cup at Cypress Point in 81, obviously just a fan, I've never played there, but a fantastic place to play the Walker Cup. How, who else was in the team? Many other, it must have been some other English guys in there as well, presumably then. Yeah, Roger Chapman, myself, Ronan Rafferty, Philip Walton, um, Jeff Godwin got in because of winning that European team. So Boxy was always a bit miffed because Boxy, that it really cost him a Walker Cup spot. Yeah. Um, uh, who else was in it? Well, Duncan Evans was a British amateur champion. Yeah, yeah I remember Duncan. Yeah. yeah. So Duncan got in. Um, Colin Dalgleish got in. Ian Hutchin got in. Um, and who was yeah, who was the captain of that uh, team? The captain was Rodney Foster. Oh right. So there, yeah. There was ten. There was ten of us. I think it was a ten-man team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rodney was yeah. a character. Rodney was a character. Yeah, lovely Rodney, and yeah. um, you know we we had a we had a pretty good side really when you look at it. Um, and then um, yeah, we went over there and stayed at Pebble Beach, in the hotel, the lodge it was incredible. Uh, I shared with Roger Chapman, and I was snoring a lot, so he moaned. So we ended up getting a room each, so that was even even better. Um, <laughs> yeah, you had steak and eggs in the morning, and you know it was just incredible. Mm. Um, we played, we, you know, we went over there on the Sunday, Monday and played loads of practice rounds around Cypress Point. We played Pebble Beach as well. But Cypress Point is the best course on earth, I think. It's the best course I've ever played. And it's just tremendous how it comes out and goes into the pines and then comes back out and goes into the dunes and then it comes back out and goes to the sea. And mm. the 16th is an absolutely incredible par three. Um, yeah, so that that was you know I was lucky to play all four games there as well. 
um, Rodney put us in with um, <clears throat> uh, my first pairing was with Duncan Evans. Although Roger Chapman and myself had played foursomes for England and in that European team championships, and we'd never lost. For some reason, I don't know why, Rodney paired, paired me with um, Duncan Evans and Roger with, with McAvoy. And we, we both lost, so that was in the morning. In the afternoon, I won my singles match against Dick Von Tacky. Don't know exactly. We called him Dick Von Sticky, but <laughs> Dick Von Tacky, I think his name was. Um, I beat him. He was only he was only in his twenties. And then uh, Roger and Roger Chapman himself said to Rodney, <clears throat> "We said, look, we were unbeaten in foursomes, and we weren't really happy about the partners you put us with. Um, you know, can we play? Can we play tomorrow in the morning foursomes if you want us to play?" And uh, so he, he said, I'll think about it. And uh, he came to us, you know, that night and he said, yeah, OK, as an unbeaten foursomes partnership, I'll put you together and you're going out first and you've been paired against Siegel and Sutton. <laughs> so we said, oh, thanks for that, Rodney. So um, we're playing their best two players, you know, Jay Siegel and Hal Sutton. And Hal, Hal was a star then, you know, even before he turned pro. And uh, we held on nicely and we were actually one down playing the 16th, you know, the famous one over the Pacific, yeah. 230 yards. And um, Hal Sutton was on the tee first and he got a two or a one iron out. And for some unknown reason, he, he hit it 50 yards right into the Pacific and splosh, it comes down. So Roger and myself looked at each other and, Rod said, well, you know, it'd be silly to go for it because they'd have to go for it from the tee again and make, you know, make a birdie. If they make par, they made five. So you could just chip it across with a seven iron onto the fairway bit, which the members do. The members play it as a par four because they can't carry. Right. Then, you know, I pitch it on. So that's what we did. We hit a seven iron over. I pitched it on. He held the putt. We made par. So that brought us back to, to level. It's all square with two to go. And I hit a nice drive off 17 along the sea. And Roger hit a great nine iron and he stiffed it to about a foot. So we birded that, and went one up. And then basically we, we both parred the last. So we beat them one up, which was, I, I hold a smelly little three footer left to right. And um, yeah, we beat Sutton and Siegel. So that was fantastic. So, so just, we were, just, sorry. We were, just, unbeaten, yeah, we were still unbeaten, which was nice, you know. Yeah, I was just going to say for the people who don't know, I mean, obviously, most people have heard of Hal Sutton went on to win a major, but Jay Siegel was the ultimate amateur, really, wasn't he? Insurance he companies was. in Philadelphia, and then he went on the Champions Tour when he was 50, didn't he? And he was pretty successful there. Yeah, he was He was the American equivalent of Peter McAvoy, really. Yeah, um, yeah. He played maybe even the better player. Like you say, long term, he, he did really well. Yeah, strange why he never turned pro, really, because he, he was a fantastic player. I, I played against him, actually, a couple of times, and he, he was a brilliant golfer, wasn't he? Awesome, yeah. Yeah, he just, um, he was a bit like Peter McAvoy, he just didn't want to turn pro, I think, and just yeah. enjoyed his life yeah. the way he was. Yeah. Um, but the, one of the funny things was that Walker Cup, um, when we all got, we had to introduce ourselves on camera, and, um, you know, I was only 18, Ronan Rafferty was 17. Philip Walton, you know, sort of spoke, spoke like that, you know, with his <laughs> high, high voice. Duncan Evans. So, yeah, I think Ronan went on first and he said, um, hey, Ronan Rafferty from Warren Point. I don't work and I don't go to school. So that was his introduction. Duncan <laughs> Evans said, um, uh, Duncan Evans from Leek in Staffordshire. Uh, I play golf and my dad runs a fish and chip shop. <laughs> but it, you know, and then you had Phil Walton coming on and, and myself. And it was only McAvoy that sort of came over half intelligent, really. Because when, when the Americans came on, you had Corey Pavin. Hi, Corey Pavin, UCLA studying psychology. You know, and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hal Sutton. I'm a son of a billionaire and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> And, and Jay Siegel. So, you know, I've got the video somewhere. It is hilarious. Yeah. 
So yeah. just just wrapping that up though on that one. So they had a great team. You mentioned uh, obviously Seagull was playing about Sutton, Corey Pavin. Who else was playing on that team? Well, but Dick. We don't, I'm not sure who Dick is, but the Dick other one. Bond's Dicky. Yeah. Uh, you had Jody Mudd played as well. He was another name some people yeah. might remember. Yeah. Uh, they had some really good amateurs. Um, Ron Cummins, he turned pro. He, he ended up at the Wisley actually over here. Yeah. Did a pro jobs there. Yeah. Um, uh, going back to the, you know, but going back to Roger and I winning in the morning, Jay um, Sutton and Siegel, it worked out as well that Roger played Sutton in the singles in the afternoon and I played Jay Siegel All right. in, the in the afternoon. I don't know how that worked out, whether they fixed it. Mm. Anyway, Roger beat Sutton again, so that was fantastic <clears throat> play for him. But I was... Um, i come across Jay Siegel and he wanted to get his own back. I was level par after 13 um, round Cypress Point and I lost six and five. Mm. Jay Siegel was six under after 13. So that, that was incredible. That shows, how, he, that shows how good a player he was then. Uh, you know, I was only 18. He just showed me how to do it. There. He was, like I said, I played quite nicely being level, but um, it's not the hardest course in the world, Cypress Point, and the weather was lovely. Mm. Uh, but he just hold everything and six birdies and 13 holes and I couldn't do much about it. Yeah, but he was uh, just going back to him, just finish it. I say I was lucky. I played against him in the Walker Cup at Sunningdale 1987. And apart from being a great golfer, he was still a great golfer then. But he was a really nice guy as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, lovely guy. And um, I remember coming to Sunningdale and watching you. Play. Oh, right. Yeah. Because there was a tournament on, I think, nearby and I came over. Did Monty play that year? Yeah, it was the PGA yeah. Championship was on. Yeah, so yeah, I came over and, what, and met a few of the. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, Jay, Jay was fantastic, and like I say, um, I had a slight incident on the second hole where the greens were so fast at Cypress Point, you know, like glass. And when I addressed the ball, my ball slightly oscillated, moved, you know, half a turn, and I backed up and I said to, to Jay, I said my ball just moved. He said, "Well, I didn't see it move," and I said, "Well, I did." Mm. So in those days, you know, you had to, it was a stroke penalty and, and basically I lost the hole and he said, well, that was really honest of you to, I said, well, it's the rules of golf. Mm. And then in the, in the evening at the dinner, Jay, Jay said something about it and, you know, it's just the spirit of the game really. And that's what it was. So that's how we were brought up to, yeah. to adhere to the rules. So mm. yeah, um, and it, it's the spirit of the Walker Cup and Ryder Cup really, although there are a few yeah. rounds that go on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, imagine. yeah. So moving on from that then, so you turned pro in 1982 and ended up having three victories on the DP World Tour, as it's now called, or the European Tour or different names it's had. But the, the career carried on going at a, at a pretty pretty fast pace, really, didn't it? Yeah, it turned with Roger Chat, myself, uh, Ronan, Philip Walton, we all um, went for our cards in eight, you know, late 81. Yeah. Uh, Ronan, Ronan missed his card and he had to try and he, he ended up getting it in South Africa where he made the top 50. That was another way of getting your card. And, you know, it was the most, he must have been nervous. I was really nervous. So I shot 85 the first day around Don Pedro that was hardly built. And you'd, you'd hit a nice drive and it would pitch in the fairway and ricochet out of bounds. It was <laughs> outrageous the place. And I was playing all right because the next day at Quinta de Lago, which was a much better golf course and, you know, ready for a golf tournament, really. I shot 69, so that got me back in it. And then I think I had a couple of 72s or whatever it was and, and got my card. And then I went to South Africa as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then on to European tour um, during that 1982 first year. And, so, uh, so 19, when was the first European tour victory? Yeah, that was a Dutch Open. So, again, in those days, it was, you know, Monday qualifying. So I had to do the Monday, Monday qualifying. But if you in the rules were if you made the cut, you know, the previous tournament, you didn't have to pre-qualify, you know, on the Monday for the next tournament. Yeah. So it was all about those days, you know, 140-odd started. It, top 65 made the cut. If you made the cut, you were guaranteed to get into the next tournament because it was only the top 60 that were exempt. Oh, okay, right, yeah. 
you know, it was a tough way yeah. here. Mm. It, it was great if you'd been on tour a few years and you were in the top 60 every year. Mm. You could plan you could plan your diary because you you knew you were in every tournament. Yeah, yeah. But the, the rookie, Gordon Brown Jr., that, that you know, poor old Gordy, you know, we all loved loved him to death. And um that's the wrong word to say, really, but yeah. you know, Gord Gordy was lovely. And going back to that, Gordy was actually left out of that 1981 um, Walker Cup side. Um it, they left him out of the European Team Championship, Scotland did. And, of course, Gordy got his own back by winning two tournaments in 1982 on the main tour. Mm. And Warren must have felt a bit bit silly, really, after not putting him in the Walker Cup side. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So Gordy, he turned pro the same year, did he, in 1982? Yeah, Gordy, Gordy turned pro in 81. Right. Uh, late 81 with Roger. Um, you know, Gordy should have been in that side, really. Yeah. Philip Walton, Rona Rafferty, we all turned pro. Colin mm. Dalglin, Duncan Evans, he turned pro as well. Yeah. We, were, we all went to that Portuguese um, tour school. Mm. So you were, uh, did you win the Dutch? Did you win the Dutch Open in 1982 then? Yeah. So leading into that, Gordy won um, the the Welsh Classic, I think it was, or the Coral. Uh, that was played at Porth Call. He beat Greg Norman. You know. And, we all thought, you know, God, Gordy's won one. You know, we why can't we, you know, you know have a go? And we, well, I got to um, the Dutch Open, and I played pretty well at the British Open. I finished thirty fifth, playing with Floyd in the third round, so I was playing quite well. And I got to a fantastic golf course called Dupin, uh, which was a Harry Colt, um, you know, Heathland on on the on the sand belt of. of as you know, they've got Hilversum and yeah, yeah. they've got some great golf courses in Holland. Yeah. And Dupin was another Harry Colt great golf course. And of course, being brought up at the Neville and Crowborough and Royal Ashdown and all these sort of Heathland courses, I liked it straight away. Um, and I shot 67, 65 last two days to win it by a couple from, I think, Vincenti Fernandez and David Ferretti. Mm. So that was my first win, yeah. And so that kind of moved you on to getting in the to uh, playing in the eighty three Ryder Cup. You must have qualified for the team then. Yeah, again, it all was a, was another step to go into another level, really. And because um, when I won, that exempted me for the rest of the year. So again, I you know in those days we played in everything. You never had a week off, really. Mm. Got me in the Lancome Trophy at the end of the tournament, end of the year, and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and Gord, Gordy won again at the four star, you know, the Moore Park programs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, that sort of led me into 83, where again I went to South Africa and played, you know, as part of the European, it's all conglomerated into one now these days, but it's all, you know, you played South African tour or African tour and then Asian tour, then European tour. Mm. Um, so I played South Africa, then I had four weeks in Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia. And, Philippines yeah and then we started in 83 um had a bit of a slow start to 83 but then I had some really good finishes um the Belfry um I, I, then I had lots of seconds and thirds um and my last second place was at the TPC behind Bernard Langer right <clears throat> um yeah shot 66 67 68 70 the last round and Langer beat me by a couple of shots, but that was the last um, qualifying tournament for the 83 Ryder Cup. Right. Because in those those days, there was no picks. It was all top 12. Oh, okay. Well, because the European Tour had wranglings with, with Faldo and Langer and Seve and Sand, because they wanted to play in America. But obviously, the European people, you know, European Tour wanted them to play in Europe as much as possible. So they didn't have any picks. So if, if you wanted to play in the Ryder Cup, you had to play a bit more in Europe, which they did. Mm. And they were all good enough to play maybe half the tournaments we did, but they were all good enough to, to get in the side. Yeah. So, so Faldo, Woozy, uh, Seve, Langer, Lyle, they, they all got in that 83 side. Mm. Um, and as I say, that second place got, my, got me into 11th place. He okay. got me in the 83 side. Uh, hmm. I think Gordon Brown Senior was 80, was the 12th. 
Brian Wakes was in it. Canazar is. Yeah. Again, we had a pretty, we had a good team going over there. It's ironic, really, you say that, you know, the players wanted to play in America and not so much in Europe. It's still kind of the same to this day now, isn't it? Yeah, because um, it's all, as we know, America's always had the better courses, always had better money. Yeah. Um, you know, it's great playing America with the crowds. Yeah. Um, we get some great crowds in Britain and, and some in Europe, but yeah, look, and of course, you've got the three majors in, or the three of the four majors in America. So the guys like Seve and Faldo, they, they all wanted to play over there more. Mm -hmm. So just going back to that Ryder Cup there, so 1983, Ron, you qualified 11th. As far as I'm aware, you were the second youngest player to play in the Ryder Cup then after Nick Faldo. Yeah, I was 20, 20 in about five months, I think. And yeah, yeah. just I was second, um, second eldest, I think, to yeah, Faldo. Second youngest. Kind of youngest, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. And Jack Klim was our was you know our captain that year, first time he'd done it. And um, you know, I was only twenty, and the, you know, Seve was only twenty six, but he sort of he, he seemed so much older, you know. And Tony was only in his early forties, but you know what it's like when you're younger. You always feel that people are so much, <laughs> you know, they're not they're not old at the time, but they 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 come across as, you know, your, your elders. So yeah. I was the youngest, you know, by far. And um, Tony, you know, we, Tony did it so well because we had Concord going over there and uh, with team stuff. He, he did it, you know, he was a great captain. And then uh, he said, um, you know, I'm going to pair you with Seve. Mm. First day, you're going to play four ball, foursomes and four ball. And uh, we lost in the morning. Um, in the foursomes to Tom Kite and um, Calvin Pete. Um, you know, and I remember there was no sort of real plan, even on the putting green beforehand. Seve said, you know, do you want me to go first or do you want to tee off first in the foursomes? I said, well, Seve, I'm a little bit nervous. I, you know, can you, can you tee off first? He went, he went, no, that's good, you're nervous. And you tee off first. So hey. I said, oh, thanks for that, Seve. So, <laughs> I hit him straight in the driver, straight in the bunker. And uh, he said, Paul, don't worry where you hit me. I get you on green from anywhere. <laughs> yeah, so that was great. And uh, five, he hit five iron outs within 15 foot on the first hole, you know. So he gave you a lot of confidence. Mm. Um, but we lost that game. Kite and P Pete beat us. Uh, but in the afternoon, we beat Floyd and uh, Curtis Strange, I think it was. So that was that was great. And then... The next morning, Saturday, we were we were paired again in the four balls. So it was four ball foursomes this time, and uh, we halved that morning. Can't quite remember who we played. It might have been Floyd and Strange again, maybe. But and and you know, again, it, going back to being knackered and tired, you know, you're travelling over there. The heat. It was very hot and humid in Florida. And you play practice rounds and dinners and, you know, I'd played three rounds. So I was, I was ready for a rest in the afternoon, really. Sit around the pool. <laughs> and uh, Jacqueline, because we were staying at the PGA National, you know, that was where it was played, where they play the Honda. And uh, Tony said, look, Paul, you're not having a rest. You're out again with Seve in the foursomes. I said, oh, all right, Tony. I said, who are we playing? He said, you're playing Tom Watson. And Bob Gilder, I said, oh, that's okay. I love Tom Watson. I've always wanted to play with him. So, um, Stevi, uh, Stevi and I, I can't remember who, who teed off first or whatever, but we, we won the first hole. And on the second hole, we're, we're both in the middle of the fairway. And uh, I'd driven off, put him in the fairway. And the Americans went first. I think it was Bob Gilder. He... He hit an eight iron. It just floated up in the wind a bit. And the pin was tight right. And the ball came down, plugged into the right-hand bunker. You know, it, he hit it in the right-hand bunker. And uh, Seve sent me up to the green because he wanted to make sure it was, you know, to see how, if they could get up and down. So I walked all the way up to the green and uh, saw their ball absolutely plugged and no shot at all. So I turned around to Seve and... Sort of, you know, I went there dead. So Seve went like that 150 yards away and he hit a great iron into 
sort of 20 foot left of the pin. So, you know, we made four, they made five, we went two up. And we, we were five up after six holes, just wow. incredible. And mm. uh, managed to hang on. I think we beat them three and two in the end. Um, and and that, that led us into the, um, the singles. You know, I think it was, we were eight, eight. So we were level going into the singles. And I got drawn against Curtis Strange. And I was three under after nine, three up, and just basically, you know, I hung on and, and beat him three and one in the end. So, so you great. had a you had a great uh, a great debut overall, and then playing with Seve. I mean, what there's not many people can say that they've done that in their time. I mean, yeah. talking about legends of the game, he is a true Absolutely. legend of European Tour golf, isn't he? Absolute legend, and as I said, he's he's the best short game I've ever seen and ever will see. Uh, putting and bunker play and chipping and because when when we arrived at um, the PGA, you know, National in Florida, as you know, it's all Bermuda grass. And the, you know, these days in, when in, in, they cover it in rye grass, you know, when they play in February yeah. and March, yeah. so we were playing October. In those days, it was all Bermuda grass. And of course, around the greens, it was this deep in Bermuda. And we were, all, we were all trying to hit the ball first and get it out and nudge it. And Seve said, no, Paul, you know, sandwich and just open it up and you play it like a bunker shot. Don't, you know, that's what they all do now with all the rough around the greens. They, yeah. they play like Bay Hill the other day. You know, it was ridiculous how they set that golf course up, but it showed you how tough it was in the wind. But we all learned from Seve, you know, playing it like bunker shots. Um, so because he, he'd played out in America before and won... He was Masters champion that year in 83, and he'd won the Masters in 80. So Seve was fantastic, you know, showing us how to play it out of the rough mm. around the greens. Um, and Seve blames himself a bit because he was three up, I think he was three up against Fuzzy Zeller um, with a, after 10 holes, and he did well to get a half. It, that was the famous three wood. He did it twice, actually. He did a the famous three wood out the bunker at the last at PGA National over the water, yeah. 250 yards. He actually did it playing with me in the four, in the four ball. Um, I think it was in the morning of the, of the second day. And Seve said to me in the practice rounds, he said, if we're in trouble, I'm going to cut the corner off. And even if I'm in the bunker or the rough, I'll, I'll have a go at getting it on the green, you know, big dog leg left. Mm. So um, he ended up tying. <clears throat> he got half with Zeller. And obviously we lost by a point, you know, 14 and a half, 13 and a half. Mm. Gordy, Gord, Gordon Brown Senior told me a story um, years, 25 years later. He said, I couldn't tell you at the time, but he said, when I was playing my match, um, I think he was playing Bob Gilder. Um, Bob Gilder had hit it in the hazard on the right and Gordon was up the left for two. And uh, Bob Gilder dropped, dropped the ball. And Gordon didn't see him drop the ball. And Gordon didn't realise that he was in the hazard. So Gordon's telling me this story. You know, I think he told it to every player apart from Seve because Seve would have killed him. <laughs> so Gordon, Gordon didn't see him drop the ball by the right-hand hazard because he was, you know, 100 yards to the left. So Gilder plays his fourth shot in. But of course, Gordy thinks he's played his third shot in because he doesn't think he's in the hazard. This is a typical Gordon Brand senior, <laughs> as you know. You know, bless him. And um, so Gordy plays his third shot on the green, and Gordy's one down. And uh, Bob Gilder puts it up to sort of four foot past, and Gordy misses his putt, and then he gives he gives it to him because he, he thinks he's hit one shot less than. <laughs> He won down. He thinks he's, he's got two to two to beat me. He gives him the putt, and then I think it was his one of the spectators. So they said to him afterwards. You know, he, he said, "No, that was for his. You know, that was for heart to half yeah, the yeah. hole. If you missed that, you'd have you'd have got half, Gordy." <laughs> he said, "Well, I didn't know. I didn't know." He said, uh, "He didn't tell me, <laughs> and I didn't know." <laughs> and basically, if Bob Gilder missed that putt. We we'd have tar you know, we would have been yeah, a full yeah. team. We, we that would have been like a victory, you know. First you, time in America that we got anywhere near, you know. And he didn't and, tell anybody that night then. He didn't tell he, he wouldn't have told Sebi then. 
He wouldn't. He didn't tell me for twenty five years. Twenty. Wow. Years. You know the grand match we played. In? Yeah, 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 yeah. He actually told me one evening there. <laughs> he said, I've got to tell you. <laughs> of course, I wasn't too happy. But I said, Gordy, that sums you up, really. But yeah. you know, it wasn't really his fault. Bob Gilder was a bit sly. Yeah, I was going to say, Gilder could have said something, couldn't he? Well, having a quick drop, and you know what it's like in those days. We had a, we would have had a PGA official on the, yeah, the fairway, but really bad communication, mm. saying that Gilder has actually had one more shot than than Gordy knows about. Yeah, which is a bit, um, you know, anyway. Oh, you it was go. incredible. It would never happen now, but although it was on TV. Yeah. Um, it would, you'd never happen now. In 83, it was mm -hmm. limited, you know. So that moved on to the the, uh, the 85 one, uh, which was a historic match, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, similar sort of side. You know, we had... Played at the, Bel played at the Belfry. Belfry, yeah, Wuzzy, Sevi, Faldo, Lange, yeah. all the guys, you know, Howard Clark, Sam Torrance, myself, the Spaniards, Canizares, Pinero, Rivero. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Sevi, obviously. Um, so we had a good side again. In those days, I think it was, it was either top nine or top ten and the two, two or three picks. So Faldo was a pick that year because he played, like I said, more in America. Mm. Um, I can't remember the other two picks, but because I won the PGA and I was, you know, I had a good run through that early 80s, um, I was guaranteed being in the side. What year um, did you win the PGA then? That 85, yeah. yeah. I had a, that, was, that was the best run I had, really. I, I won in South Africa, 19 under, around Rand Park, the South African Classic. Um, then we played a few in Asia, but then coming back to Europe, I lost in a playoff in Tunisia where my ball got stuck up a tree in the middle of the fairway against Stephen Bennett after <laughs> watching him get up and down from an impossible bunker shot. He got up and down to get in the playoff. So I was a bit miffed that I, you know, really I put that down as half a win winning the Tunisian Open. Mm. <clears throat> so I won in South Africa and I tied first at Tunisia. Then I won the PGA at Wentworth. And I was third at the Daniel Masters behind Trevino. And I was third at uh, the Irish Open at Royal Dublin behind um, Seve. Right. So I was, I was leading the order of merit. You know, I was number one in oh, Europe right. for, yeah. for two, two, two and a half until Sandy Lyle won the British Open. Yeah. So again, you know, it was nice to get up to number one, even though it was for two and a half months or two months. Yeah. Um, and you beat Sandy in a playoff, didn't you, at the PGA Championship? Beat, beat Sandy that year at the PGA uh, at Wentworth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that mirror really got me in, in, you know, guaranteed my spot into the Ryder Cup. Yeah. Um, but it did, you know, it affected me because I, I, caught, I caught tonsillitis during the Dutch Open. You know, it was a week after the British Open at St George's, which Lyle won. So that put him number one in Europe above me. And... Um, I got tonsillitis and glandular fever. I've always struggled with nasal and throat problems. And you don't realise how much it, you know, takes out of you. And when you're, as you know, when you're doing well, winning, and I had, all, I had a hell of a, a running, you know, hell of a streaky run there. Uh, I didn't realise how knackering it was and ended up with glandular fever and I felt terrible. I think I played one round at the Dutch Open that to come home and see a specialist and all this sort of stuff. And of course, it was a bit of a quandary then whether I, whether I had my tonsils out because I had the Ryder Cup, you know, in four or five weeks' time at the Belfry. I said, you know, he said, well, the operation, then you'll have about six, seven weeks to get over it. And I said, well, I can't have the operation, you know, during the summer or end of the summer because I've got the Ryder Cup, which was the best move I've ever made, really. So. I've he gave me drugs to sort of get me through it. But I felt terrible. I'd lost a lot of strength and, and you know, I wasn't eating properly. But managed to get through the 85 Ryder Cup. And that's when I, after that, I had the, the um, surgery to have my tonsils out. But yeah, go go back to the 85 PGA at Wentworth, really, because that leads into it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the Ryder Cup at the Belfry, obviously, that was the famous one when, when there was a win that year. You all stood on the clubhouse roof with the champagne and everything, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, that was um, that was fantastic. And again, I did 
I didn't play with Seve that year um, because there was more Spaniards playing. Um, he partnered um, Seve with Panera, I think. Yeah. And they, they were a really good team. Yeah. So I got partnered with, with Woozy. Right. Um, and we, we were left out, actually, the um, left out in the morning foursomes. <clears throat> so Woozy was a bit miffed at that because, you know, he was a fantastic player at the time, obviously. And um, we were put in the four ball in the afternoon. Um, we played uh, Fuzzy Zeller and Hubert Green, <clears throat> who had, um, I think Fuzzy had, uh, Hubert Green had won the PGA. So in those days in America, if you won the PGA or the US Open, you, you got into their side, mm. which Andy North won the US Open. Yeah. And, and uh, Hubert Green had won the PGA, I think. So, you know, they're you know, great players again, but um, they, they were maybe a bit weak because they won those tournaments. They got in, but they were weaker than other players, I think. It was just their policy. Yeah. So if you're the US Open champion, you got in. Yeah. And that is Andy North. I think he only won about two tournaments, but two of them were US Open champions. So he actually, I'll correct you there, Weiwei. I do know that fact. He won two tournaments on the PGA Tour. No, you were at US yeah. Open. He won two yeah. US Opens and he never won another tournament. Yeah, incredible. I thought it was something like that. Yeah, no, he only won two. Yeah, so that was one of them in 85, which, yeah. you know, we always remember Sam Torrance playing him in, in the singles and he, I was there. He skied it. Put the last of the belfry into the water. Yeah. Sam, Sam, Paul, Paul looked his a little bit really because it carried the late bar about a foot. Yeah. And left in a nine iron in. You know, I was hitting when I played Floyd, I was hitting the four iron in. Mm -hmm. You know, got to go further right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going back to Woozy, we, we played those, you know, uh, Fuzzy Zero and Hubert Green, and we were, we, we were, uh, we shot um, 64, I think it was, better ball. We had a, oh, that's right, I birdied the last. I, I hit a drive and a five iron and birdied the last to beat them one up. So that was, you know, they, they were all little turning points that were going for us because obviously, you know, Britain and Ireland and then Europe, obviously, from 79, we hadn't won it since 56, uh, um, 1957, I think it was, at Lindrick, mm. going back to the... Christy O'Connor Jr. and Peter Alice and Bernard Hunt days, you know. Yeah. So we hadn't won it for 28 years. And those little things just changed the Ryder Cup that week, you know, holding putts at the right time and mm. getting the right points at the right time. So Woozy and I did well there. And then in the morning, we got um, paired again and we played the same two again. We played Fuzzy Zeller and Hugh Green. Mm. And we played just as well. We beat them four and three the next morning. Yeah. In the afternoon, we played Curtis Strange and Jacobson and we, we lost in the foursomes. So but the only two games I've lost out of the nine games I played were the foursomes. Mm. So, um, yeah, just my partners let me down, obviously. <laughs> for, those, for those two tournaments, for those two um, foursomes matches. I was, was going to say, you, your record was six, you had six wins and a half, didn't you? Yeah, out of the nine, six wins, obviously winning both my singles against Strange and Floyd. Yeah. Huge. And then obviously having Seve and, and Woozy as partners was fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, we, we dovetailed well. You know, Woozy played fantastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, when we shot that 64, I think we had four birdies each or whatever, but we had them on different holes, you know. So, okay. Yeah. That, that really helps when you dovetail like that. And like I say, I birded the last of the Belfry to, to win one up. And if you were going to choose uh, out of those two Ryder Cups, which would be the most memorable for you then? I know it's a very hard question, that different, you know, one was a win, one was a loss. Which, which one would you say was was more memorable? Well, I think, yeah, I think they're both really memorable, obviously, because playing with Seve four times and winning two and a half points with him. Um, but obviously, 85 was incredible. To me, you know, it was like winning the FA Cup, really, as a team sort of thing. You know, it was fantastic in your own country. Mm. With Concord flying over the clubhouse. and Yeah, I remember it. I remember watching it. Yeah, it's a shame not all the team got out. That was our team room, room above the pro shop. Right. And um, so we all met in, I think it was a, it was a hotel room, you know, in the Belfry, yeah, yeah. but it was our team yeah. room above the pro shop. And um, it was a shame that some of them missed out on it, you know, because Sandy wasn't on the roof. 
um, Canazar is he, he went off and a few other but but the, the Seve was there Howard Clark Sam Torrance myself Jacqueline Woozy Langer so we had we had a good group on there it was a shame not all of them mm. um, came out onto the roof and started you know because the the crowd were fantastic in front of us all on the putting green yeah um, and yeah. of course when when Sam was captain there in two thousand two. He made sure that everybody, because they had the same team room, and he made sure everybody got on the roof that year. Oh, okay, learned, yeah. yeah, yeah. He learned from it. He made made sure everybody got yeah. onto there, you know. So just just you know, finishing off on this tour, I'd really, you know, everybody kind of thinks Seve was the man who turned the Ryder Cup round for Europe. You know, from the uh, from the eighty three yeah. one in in Florida, and then moving on to eighty five. Would you agree with that or not? Totally agree. Yeah, and and what people have got to remember and, and they maybe don't know the story so much is Seve first played in it in 79 at Greenborough when it went European um, and then in 1981 I went to it as, a, an, as an amateur at Walton Heath Seve was left out the side you know he was Masters champion in 80, won the British Open in 79 and because he was having rows with the tour, European tour about appearance money. Um, Langer and, and John Jacobs, I think, was a captain that year. All, all sorts of political rows going on and committees saying he shouldn't get appearance money and all this sort of stuff. So they actually banned Seve from playing in 81, although mm. he was in the side. Mm. Which, you know, you've got to give it to Seve and to Tony Jacklin, really, because... Tony Jacklin had to then coerce Seve to, to come back and play in 83. Right. But if I was Seve, I would have said, yeah. on your part, you know, we're not getting paid any money for, for doing this. And, um, you know, as you know, the Ryder Cup, they, they get a little bit more now than, than we did in the 80s and 90s, maybe. But I, I wouldn't have blamed Seve to say, no, you know, you didn't want me in 81. I'm not never going to play in it again. Mm. So fair, fair play to him, really. He was, you know, fair play to, to him and Tony Jacklin, and obviously yeah. Tony, he had a he had a house in Spain, I think, at the time, and, and he'd moved from Jersey, wherever. I think he was at Valderrama, so he knew Seve well, and, and Tony, you know, he's a lovely guy, so he talked Seve round, and you know, Seve, this is going to be for your career, and you know, you, it's in America, PGA, Nicholas, you know, Jack Nicholas is their captain, and. You know, that was another great thing, you know, with Jack being there, Captain 83, Jerry. You know, we went to his house yeah. in Florida, wow. West Palm Beach, and he had a helicopter and a yacht and a tennis court, <laughs> a golf complex, and, you know, just amazing. Yeah. And that, I didn't have a camera at the time, and you did you no mobile phones. And you can't really go into someone's house and start taking pictures of those. <laughs> yeah, Jack invited us all, all the team round for the... Um, for a dinner you know marvelous times yeah yeah um, you know but then going back to Seve so Seve said yeah I will play and then of course he got partnered against with me you know 20 year old <laughs> and he said Tony you know I said I'd play and now you've partnered me with Paul you know <laughs> but he was fine in the end because Seve was like a god you know yeah, yeah. And so yeah you got to give it to Seve you know it's easy to give flack out mm. um, and really he was worth every penny he could get out of every sponsor of every tour of the European tour. Pay, pay him 50 grand a week, pay him 100 grand a week because, no, you know, he was the Tiger Woods before Tiger Woods. Yeah. Nobody, no, you know, you're trying to sell the European tour. And if a sponsor wants to pay Seve whatever appearance money, just let them do it. Mm. And that was what it was over. It was over. Mm. You, know, you know what it's like. You get the odd bit of jealousy out there and the, the green mask comes on and mm. but really the other players should have been I'm not naming any names but <laughs> the other players should have been just we need Seve to be playing in all our tournaments yeah. you know and because he was like you say he was a kickstart of the Ryder Cup and the European Tour mm. no, no, no. your Caldos, your Woozies, your Langers yeah you know, yeah, no, he had an aura about him. I remember when I turned pro, I mean, he did have an aura, definitely. And it must have been the same when, you know, Tiger Woods was in his prime. Obviously, every sponsor on the PGA Tour, or rather around the world, wanted these players to play. And understandably, 
you know. Yeah. So, but anyway, there you go. So great memories of the Ryder Cup for you. Two Ryder Cups, six wins, not a bad record, really. Great memories. Yeah, six and a half out of nine. I was yeah. very, very pleased with. Couldn't have got okay. a lot better than that. And two, two out of two or two out of four in the Walker Cup was nice as well because, yeah. you know, Cypress points. So, you know, and, and going back, when you're younger, Jerry, it's like Mike Clayton says, all, all these great golf court, um, great golfers at the time, and, and you can say it now with even the likes of Rory, if you said to Rory, who designed this course you just won at, He'd go, I've not got a clue. Mm. And we were all the same. Um, who designed Dupin where I won the Dutch Open? I haven't got a clue. Mm. You, you find out it was Harry Colt. And you find out, hang on, Wentworth was designed by Harry Colt. Mm. And, and Walton Heath was partly braid, you know. And, and all these, I, I love Harry Colt, Colt golf courses. And, you know, you, I, I've done well on them. And you, you find out, oh, that's why, you know, because you, you yeah. love the way that they're all set up and the way they, mm. they play, you know. But as you say, though, when you're younger, you don't really think anything about that, do you? You just, it's like the yeah. foot going back to the strut and jug, as you said. I mean, I, I, I had no idea about uh, that, but it's, but it's all, fun. yeah, the, his, the history of the game's all interesting, so. It, so yeah, it only gets interesting when you, you get older a little bit more and you, you want to learn a bit more about course design and, Lynx courses and Heathland courses and, you know, moorland courses you've got and downland courses, mm. parkland courses. I mean, my course, Neville, half the members don't know whether it's a parkland or a Heathland. <laughs> they eat the Heathland, you know, and they go and plant trees all over the place. And, yeah, like you, you know, you get this at golf clubs. Yeah. You have to look after what you've got. Mm. If, it's no, lynx, if it's a Lynx, you don't go and start putting in trees everywhere. <laughs> if it's Heathland, the same sort of thing, really. You've got the fine, you know, I have members coming to me and saying, well, how have we got lynx grass when it's in Tunbridge Wells, mm. in land? I said, because it's Heathland mm. and, and your fescues and your fine bents and fescues, they like growing on acidic soil, you know. And mm. you go and plant trees everywhere, then that affects all the grasses. Mm. You wouldn't go down to a lynx course and put trees all along the fairways. <laughs> but as, you say, as you say that, you wouldn't think no. about that when, you, when you're younger and you're just pitching up and playing, do you? But, you know, it's right, you go to Walton Heath and it is a Heathland, as it says in the name. It is what it is on the can. And, it, you know, you look across there and it's, uh, it's just yeah. great golfing territory, really, isn't it? Exactly. We're so lucky to have so many. Um, and again, you know, I have people saying to me, well, you know, Neville's on clay. And I said, well, so is Crowbra Beak and Royal Ashdown, Piltdown, and, and actually Walton Heath is all on clay. Mm. Um, but then obviously in Surrey, you've got the lucky ones that are on that sand belt. Yeah, yeah. Um, your Bunning Dales, your Wentworth, your Hankley Commons, you know, the Swindley Forest, your West Hills, and, your, you know, you go on and on and on. Um, New Zealand Club, we all yeah. love them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and re really, that's another... Thing that I'd say about today, a lot of the players are playing on these great big monster golf courses, like in the in in, in the deserts, you know, in Saudi or in, in Dubai, all these places. And we were lucky, really, to play tournaments at your your Sunningdale, you know, Walton Heaths, Wentworth, all these places because mm. technology, you know, they can't play there now because they hit it so far because of technology. Yeah. yeah. No, it is. It, 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 Yes, it is a shame. Some of the great, some of the courses have stood the test of time. When yeah. we still stood the test of time, but some of them would be just, uh, they'd be torn to treads, wouldn't they? The guys hit it so far now. Yeah, and going back to that, I, the, the tour actually sent me my winning um, European Open cards at Sunningdale. Um, they couldn't find my PGO winning cards, which was a shame because I played with Seve the first two rounds. Right. So he would have signed my card. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously they get lost or thrown away or whatever. But I got my four cards from the European Open that I'd won. And I played with Gallagher the first two rounds that he signed it. And Roger Davis the last round. And and what I realised, well, what there's only one par three on the back nine. Yeah. But it was actually um, from 10 to 18, the, the yardage was 3,856. You know, it was nearly 4,000 yards long the back nine 
So no wonder, you know, we were using wooden clubs, steel shafts, volata mm. balls. So, you know, that 67 I shot the last round and come back on that last nine, you know, nearly 4,000 yards long. So it, it, I think it was 7,000, three or 400 in those days. It was a hell oh, of a... Yeah. And what, what you know, when I analyse my game, I always liked longer courses. Um, I could hit one iron closer than I could a wedge. <laughs> so, you know... I, I like the drive three irons, four irons, like the Wentworths, the Walton Heaths, and and that's where I'd managed to do well on really. I was good, good chipper and putter. And so that that European Open in '87, where was that played again? Walton Heath. Walton well, Heath. Hey, sorry, yeah, because you said Sunningdale, I think. That's yeah, I thought, no, yeah. well, it, yeah, it alternated from Sunningdale to Walton Heath. Okay, yeah. So you know, I played Sunningdale in '82, then '85. I, um, 86 was at Sunningdale. Then they started alternating it. Mm. 87 was at European Open. Yeah. And then 89 was at Walton Heath. Yeah. Um, 87. Played, you, won, you won the European Open in 87, didn't you, at Walton Heath? Yeah, in 87, Walton Heath. Like I say, yeah. that was the back nine that was nearly 4,000 yards long. Yeah. So so just, yeah. Just kind of moving on from that. So I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but what you won, you won the... Uh, you played in the Ryder Cup 83, 85, and then you won the European Open in 87. And I remember when you won it, people were saying, well, was he going to get picked for the Ryder Cup? Because you, your form had kind of dropped off a bit, hadn't it? Yeah, I, I had, like I said, I had that illness in 85 and 86. I had a really poor year. I never got my strength back. And, yeah. and as you know, travelling all the time is, is not always you know, hotels and whatever. And, you know, you say regrets or whatever. I was with IMG management, you know, pretty good management time team. But if I had my time again during that 85 season, when I had all those, you know, one in South Africa and Tunisia and won the PGA and leading the order of merit, I, I'd have, because, you know, you, you've got contracts with Wilson and Pringle. And, and in those days, being young, you felt like you nearly had to play every week. You know, you hardly had a week off. And I, I did. I did miss the French Open that week um, during the during the um, British, you know, British Open was at St George's. So I did have a week off, sort of two weeks before that. But in hindsight, I wish I'd have had two to three weeks off after doing so well. And just, I think that's why I got ill because I kept pushing myself all the time. Because even when you have, as you know, even though people call it a week off, it's not really. You're still playing and practicing every day. And I went down to the St. George's with a TV crew, you know, for practice rounds before anybody got there. And it's, it's, it does wear you out. And mm. so in hindsight, I wish I'd have had two or three weeks off, really. Yeah. After I did so well. And then I don't think I'd have got ill and I'd have been carried on being better. But in 86, yeah, look, because it's so easy to lose a bit of confidence. And, you know, as you know, it's easy to miss a few cuts and you get on a roll. And 86, I had a poor year. 87, I was really struggling. <clears throat> and then I always remember the week before the European Open at Walton Heath, we played in Switzerland in Prague, you know, in European Masters. Yeah. Um, Swiss Open, more or less what it was called. And uh, I'd shot, uh, I think I'd shot 70, 71, 71. Or so. I was two under. And three, as you know, you know, there's always a low cut there. Yeah, yeah. Three under made the cut, and I'd shot two under, and it sort of compounded even more. You know, I thought because in golf or in any sport, it's so easy to keep knocking yourself, but you've you've got to give yourself some a g up sometimes. And so I sort of came away from that. I said, you know, hang on a sec. I've played played a lot better there. You know, I shot two rounds under par, just missed the cut by one. Of course, as you know, when you're missing cuts, you go home for the weekend and you're you're missing out on two medal rounds where all the people that have made the cut are playing two medal rounds, you know, and you're not, you, you go home and mope and whatever. So I, I just tried to G myself up and say, look, you played a bit better there. And I went into the European Open at Walton Heath the next week. And I, I, I could stay at home, so stayed in Tunbridge. Um, I had my house there that I'd bought in 85. And uh, I had a friend caddying for me. Yeah, he, he was in the Aer Lingus side, you know, when we won oh, okay. the English ball thing. Yeah. So Nick, Nick, Nick Massey. So 
he caddied for me. I could stay at home. And then um, we had you know, a nice couple of first rounds, I think 70, 71 or whatever. So then my, my next round, I shot 71 again. So I was four under. And Langer was leading, I think. And Greg Norman, Seve, they were all up there. And I, I blitzed the last round, you know, 67. So one by two in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and like I say that, and then I had Tony coming up to me. Because the Ryder Cup, I think, was picked the week before. Yeah. Um, so it didn't count. So Tony sent me a nice letter saying, you know, sorry that you're not coming to Muirfield with us. But to tell the truth, tell you the truth, even after winning, I, I still wasn't playing. To play in a Ryder Cup, you've really got to be on your metal, you know. Mm. And, and after the pressure of 85 and 83, you just think, I'll leave it to somebody else, you know. <laughs> so... I didn't really mind. I, I, obviously, I'd have loved to have played in 83, 87 as well. Yeah. And I was full of confidence because I just won the European Open. But, mm. it, you know, you, you're playing against some, some really tough competition. It shows, how, it shows how impressive Westwood and Poulter and those boys, when they play nine, of Seve and Langer, when they play seven, eight, ten Ryder Cups, how, you know, the longevity of their career really is, is just unbelievable. Awesome, yeah. And and as I say, I'm being honest with you now, saying I'd I'd have loved to have played three, four, five, six Ryder Cups, but you know, it is hell of a it's a hell of a pressure. Yeah. And um 85, I was shaking like a leaf coming down the last, you know, when I played Ray Floyd. Yeah. Because I, I was I was four up after eight holes against Floyd, and it was a really windy, bouncy day again. You know, I think I shot 73 or four the last day. And and that last hole, you know, just making a par on the last and beating him two up was fantastic, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and winning it. So, mm. yeah, they, you've got to give it to those, you know, like you say, your pulps that want to, because they know the pressure of it. Mm. But, also, but also, you know, although we, you know, I won one, won one and lost one in 83, 85, they, they were in a lot of winning sides. So that does give you yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of confidence. You wouldn't want to be beaten up too many times and want to keep playing in it. No, no. Like, like, they, did through, like they did through the 60s and 70s, you know. Yeah. Well, it was like the Americans when they were losing, they kind of started saying the President's Cup was better than the Ryder Cup, didn't they? Exactly, which is, as we know, is a load of rubbish. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but um, so move, moving on from 87, and then you say about your illness, you had an 85, bad year in 86. What... You know, things didn't obviously carry on going so well. What do you think the real reason was? Did, did, have you ever looked back and thought, yeah, maybe I should have, you said about doing things differently. Do you think that was kind of the cause of um, it or not? Yeah, well, in 89, I struggled a bit. Then I sort of got my game back a little bit. I think 90, 91, 92, 93, I was finishing top 50, the order of merit, and, um, you know, never want to own up to being 50th or whatever. But, yeah, but um, still, you know, still tenth, well, 10th was the best I did and 11th in, in 83 and 85. Yeah. But, you know, as you go on, the standard is getting better and better. There's more people from Australia coming over and South America, South Africa, all good players. Um, equipment was changing a bit. Um, the short game, putting was always great. Bunker play wasn't as good as it should have been. Nor from 40, 50, 100 yards in was, was not as good as it should have been. Um, and when, when you know, as we know, there you're scoring, scoring yardages. Really, you've got to be hot at that. Um, so you know, I had a few good finishes, seconds and thirds here and there in, in the nineties. And as you know, you just need that little bit of luck to to win. Although I won four times, you know, one in South Africa and obviously Tunisia, and then I won the other three. That those sort of five times, I had a bit of luck and things went for you, and you win. It's easy to, you know, I've had lots of seconds, thirds, top top tens and top fives where you just think, oh, yeah, didn't quite, you know, hold that part at the right time. Mm. Um, and lots of players go through their careers and they, you know, you won once, didn't you, or twice? No, no, well, on the, only on the Safari Tour and Challenge Tour, not on the yeah. main tour, as you rightly you say. Know, you you, yeah, need you know how room. close it is. Yeah, you just need a bit of luck, as you say, hold a putt at the right time or not that yeah. you wish it on them. Another guy might miss a putt at the, wrong, at the right time for you. 
yeah so it all comes down to yeah that but, and you know when i analyze it as i was i was a streaky player i was um yeah. good when i was good but i yeah. wasn't consistent enough you know no but looking back on it though i mean you, you've, you've had a great you know you you can yeah. slip back in your with your slippers on my way and You've had a great career, you know, in the Ryder Cup, the Ryder Cup yeah. things. You could go on talking about them for years and yeah. years. Well, I've heard you talk about them for years and years. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I, <laughs> that's I bore people to death about it. Now. So look, looking back on it, would a uh, couple of last questions just to finish on. Would you have generally done anything different in your career to make, to be, you know, to stay out there a bit longer or... Was it a case really, you've, you know, you finally just thought, no, I've, I've just done my bit and I've had enough of it? It was a little bit like that. Um, my dad, unfortunately, passed away in 1995, six, you know, when I was 33, 34. Yeah. And he, he was a big sort of inspiration behind me. And that, that doesn't help. It didn't help me anyway. It can help mm. some guys. I know Justin Rose, you know, his dad was, was great and he, he passed away. It sort of Justin kicked on a little bit from that. But I was always... You know, I like being at home too much, I think, and mm. with my family and dad, and that, that didn't help. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, again, I'd, I'd had, because of winning the PGA, I'd had 10-year exemption from 85 to 95. Yeah. So I think I I finished in the top 120, whatever it was, in 96. So I still had my card. Yeah. 97, just struggled again, you know, and you're getting a bit older, you're 30, whatever you were there, 34, 35. So... Mm. And the standard, Jerry, as you know, the standard yeah. through the nineties and going, and then you had Tiger Woods, you know, starting his career, and mm. um, you know the players are hitting it longer, and you're getting older and stiffer, and yeah, well, yeah, this, you know, I'd love to. Everybody loves to have been better. T mm. Tiger, Tiger would love to win nineteen majors, but <laughs> yeah. it looks like he's going to have to stick on fifteen. So, which is yeah. just unbelievable, you know. Yeah. So, jacket. so um. Generally, no regrets, and really, way way. No, I don't think you can have too many regrets. I think you can do things a bit different. Like I said, I've had more rest, but yeah, because you're under so much pressure with 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 contracts, you know, and sponsors, mm. you feel mm. like you've you've got to be out there, and you know, yeah. I, as you know, in those days, if you didn't play, you didn't get paid, so you had to go yeah. out there. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. The money, the money wasn't as good. Yeah. Well, you know, that led me into doing lots of corporate stuff when I was in my 40s and, yeah. and stuff like that. So that's kept me going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, another question they asked Lenny last week about obviously golf's changing a lot, especially at the moment, you know, and you would have played a lot of golf with Greg Norman and would have uh, yeah. would have known him personally and still do know him personally. What's your kind of views then on at the moment with what's going on or what's possibly going to go on with, you know, with the Saudi Arabian-backed, New yeah. series of first event, ironically, on the which is kind of part of the Asian tour, but it's actually going to be in London on uh, the Centurion Club in June. What's your views on what he's trying to do? Because obviously the money is just unbelievable these days, and yeah. he's taken it even further. What's, what's yeah. your views on it? Well, he, he's been trying to do this for years, as you know. You know, even back in the nineties, early two thousands, trying to get more of a world tour, um, and obviously. You know the TVs, and, and you you always want the best players, don't you? A bit like the, the tennis circuit or whatever. So he's maybe trying to get a more of a world tour going. But you know, I, I love watching the PGA in the in the evenings um, in America. I don't watch so much European golf these days because it's you know on in the day or whatever. Um, but you know, Greg's been trying to do it for years, so he's obviously got in with these backers from Saudi Arabia. And like you say, I, I thought all the tournaments were going to be over there. I didn't realise that the first one's going to be at Centurion. Mm. And Gary Evans having a go at him the other day about the goal. I've not played it, so I don't know. Mm. But it's like a lot of these new ones, you know, you've got your pylons and your roads everywhere. And yeah, I know a member there, he said it's not not as bad as he's making out. But No, I mean, I, pl I played it once. It's it's not a bad course. But I, we, yeah. we were saying, but I, I, I personally believe, you know, you know, whether you like the wherever the money's coming from. But I, I just think at the moment there's room, there's room, there's still room for more tournaments. You know, not everybody has to play in every tournament. And it, and it helps the game of golf and it gives the yeah. young players more of a chance. Yeah. And I, I just think. 
I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to say. Um, it, I wrote that down my notes. It does give more players a chance to make a living at the end of the day because, you know, it's not all about the top 100, is it? You know, there's lots of pros all over the world that want to play in all tournaments and, and make a good living. Mm. Like, like, you know, that kid that won yesterday in, in, um, in the European Tour uh, in Qatar, wasn't it? You know, that was fantastic. Yeah, Ewan Ferguson. Yeah, yeah I mean, what, Ferguson, yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. watched the last couple of holes. Yeah. And I watched him hit that wood into the last. Yeah. And I, I was sort of going through it with him. I was going, right, this is <laughs> this, this is your shot that you need to mm. focus, focus and really focus on because, you know, and he hit a beautiful shot and he maybe just didn't hold it up enough. And of course, you got the water there and he wanted to, he hit a great shot in there and it just went a bit long. Mm. And uh, as with the chip, as we know, it's so easy to get a little bit handsy when you're under that pressure, mm. not do it with your body and keep a slow motion in the, you know, he was um, back into the wind and he hit it a bit hard. But what a great putt. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. And, and that and that has set him up, really, because the other kid was putting for eagle. He could have yeah. easily um, hold it and he missed and he wins. You know, that that's, as we're saying, you're going back to a little bit of luck you need to win. Yeah. You know, you and you know, Fergus, he could have missed the putt. The other kid holds and he shoots mm. 700 and he wins. But it, it uh, just, it just, uh, the third. Well, yeah. The, the thing is, I think, though, the more, the more tournaments about around the world, the more chance it gives to people. We don't, you know, everybody wants to, you know, the Masters and everything coming up, they want to watch the best players playing in a certain amount of tournaments a year. But not every yeah. tournament needs the very best players to play every single week, does it, to make it good viewing? Yeah, no, I agree with you You're there, yeah. You know, and, so... Uh, well, it'd be interesting to see who takes the invites up and comes to Centurion. Well, that is um, the thing... It will be very interesting to see. Yeah, Mickelson will be there. But he yeah, might. Well, it'll be, it'll be, that will be a very interesting, it's a very good question, really, of who yeah. will be playing, isn't it? Whether, whether Mickelson will be playing. I mean, yeah, yeah it's just going to be interesting. So anyway, we'll see what happens with it. But it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, and I'm sure the, the PGA Tour don't seem that worried about it. But, um, you know, Greg Norman's on a mission, isn't he? He is, and he has been for a lot of say since the early nine or nine mid nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. And you know, you know, we European tour, American tours. You, as soon as you sign that form, you know, you give all your rights away. And as you know, with with um, all these TV rights and media deals and all the personal stuff with, with Tiger and. You know, but you do as soon as you, you sign that form, you do to give your rights away for everything. And, and the administrators, they they sort of are in control. And, mm. and you know, America and Europe have both been guilty of it over the years. Mm. Um, but you know, and you can understand it in a way. I mean, for me, um, 1985 Ryder Cup, you know, you get nothing, you've got nothing for playing in it, although you know, it's helped me make a living. Yeah. after because of what it did for me but you lose all the rights to all the videos and all the you know youtube and, and of course mm. it all goes to the tour mm. it all, all goes as you know we weren't on in america they're like they're lucky to have pensions yeah well that's the, the main difference the tour, we used to have all our general meetings egms you know we're all you know i remember wayne riley walking out one of them because he was so annoyed that you know, the, the administrators look after themselves with all their pensions. Mm. The players, we we didn't get anything, you know. So I know what you mean. If you carry on going down this route, way, well, you're going to get us in trouble soon. <laughs> so, well, it's, but no, it's, I know what you're saying. The, the it's only the truth. It's not. It's the truth. And and basically, the, to the European tour couldn't afford to do it anyway. Yeah. You, the, the American tour could do it. Mm. And you had to have your own pensions, which, you know, I was I did that really. You, you mm. end up putting your own money away. I mean, it was more it was more difficult for the European tour because it wasn't the euro and the pound at the time. It was all the different currencies and everything, so it made it made it more tricky. But I I I, I, yeah. I agree with you, and a lot of people, you know, the pension is often a topic for, topic of conversation between older people who are players who used to play on the tour, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah, and um, America. You know they 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 have done it right, but yeah, yeah. You know it is it's amazing, really, the mm. amount of money Phil Mickelson's made and 
Yeah. Even with Norman, and then they'll be on great sort of pensions from America. Will they? Yeah. But well, it'll be interesting. Well, when, enough enough. Yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether whether Mickelson turns up at Centurion anyway. So anyway, yeah. I could I can only uh but say thanks very much for giving us your time. It took us a bit to get on the on the call because we're yeah, not techies yeah. between us. So as with the last guest, Dave Lynn asked you a question. Um, our yeah. next guest on here is a person that we we know very well and we love him greatly. Rico yeah. Steve Richardson, who of course was uh, was a, a Ryder Cup player like yourself, a one-time Ryder Cup player. We've we've known Steve for years and years and years and had some great laughs playing in the grand match. You know that uh, Peter Alice Blessing used to run, yeah. and uh, but yes, yeah, so if when I start speaking to Rico, the first question I'd like it really to come from your good self. So I say, as I said to Lenny, keep this clean. But what would you what what do you want to ask Rico? Um, I was going to say to him, I was in a side that lost, you know, by a point in '83 in the Ryder Cup. Unfortunately, I was in a side that won won in '85. What was it like for him to lose <laughs> by a point in eight, in 1991 at Kiowa and losing his match to Corey Pavin and the famous story that he might tell you about wanting to throw him in the lake after yeah. he lost him on the 17th? Yeah, so yeah. Well, that story. Well, but, yeah, how did he feel really by losing, just losing by a point, you know, it's, and then it was the only Ryder Cup he played in, but... Yeah, that was, um, that was a, just just before we finish, that was a great Ryder Cup watching. Awesome, As in yeah. Watching on the TV. I remember Rico, and he tells that story brilliantly of what he would like to have done to Corey Pavin, and you know the the putt of Langer on the last, wasn't it, and everything. I mean, it, it was it was edge of the seat stuff, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Great Ryder Cup. Yeah. So, but anyway, so you know, many thanks again for coming on and telling us the great stories, and I'm sure the people who, who are going to listen to this. You know, Seve would have been a lot of people's heroes, and clearly, having spoken to you, he was really a hero of yours as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, Mike McLean and myself played in the Madrid Open and Spanish Open when we were 17 as amateurs in 1980, and Seve had just come back winning the Masters. You know, we were playing in Spain in, in springtime and just couldn't get enough of him, you know. So, ever since then, you know, loved him. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Weiwei, and uh, we'll right. see you. Uh, look forward to seeing you, if not before, see you at Blackwell for the charity yeah. program there. And yeah. uh, I say again, many thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Cheers, Joe. Hey, thanks, Weiwei. Cheers, mate. Bye bye.